I guess the afternoon Nike is telling me, but tomorrow. Um, next up is New College of Florida. If you guys want to go ahead and come up to the front table.
going to um, get started. I want to uh, again thank everyone for your commitment to this process because it certainly has been a long and grueling day. But we have two more wonderful presentations um, just uh, left for the afternoon and we're happy to have President Michelson here and if you would go ahead and take a minute to introduce your colleagues at the table and get started with your presentation. Happy to, Madam Chair. I was afraid you were going to say it's, it's about to get longer and more grueling so I was relieved really <laughs> how that sentence came no. out. Uh, I got a call about 10 o'clock last night, maybe uh, someone else here did as well from our board chair, Colonel Mickey Prochet, who regrettably has uh, personal circumstances that keep him from being here today. And uh, he apologizes. I apologize as well. He did ask me to convey to the board that he thought President Michelson was doing a great job, so I <laughs> pass that along for what it's worth with no comment. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity. I know you're reaching the glazed eye moment. Uh, so I, I hope I can offer something uh, a little different just because uh, of the way New College relates to the entire system in a little different way. We have, after all, no grades, no credit hours, uh, all full-time students, no graduate programs. Uh, 
And just for perspective's sake, I would root these differences in our origins as a private school. Uh, we were chartered in October of 1960, which means we're coming up, as most of you know, on our 50th anniversary, Founders Day coming up in October. And the mothers and fathers of Sarasota, once upon a time, self-conscious about the role of Sarasota in the arts and culture and music and theater, began to think of itself as a college town without a college. And so through a cooperative endeavor between the leaders of the community, uh, some other folks from outstanding institutions such as Columbia and Wesleyan University in the Northeast, and surprisingly enough, people forget the Congregational Church, which had a major stake in the origins of New College, pumping some serious money into it at the start, created a small liberal arts college, which from the start they wanted to be distinctive, do things quite differently, one thing they did different from the get-go was to peg tuition among the top three in the country. They figured they would get the Rolls-Royce effect out of that. And they also figured every time the New York Times did a story on the rising rate of tuition, New College would get a mention. And that turned out to be the case. So the irony, of course, is that now that the college is widely recognized for value purposes, the quality of education in relation to the price tag, once upon a time it was among the most highly priced schools in the country. Uh, the heyday of the 60s with all the great schemes of those early pioneer days gave way to the tough 70s and what saved us was the clarity of our mission. Uh, New College was about to go out of business when I arrived to be the Chief Administrative Officer in 1992 when we were still part of the uh, University of South Florida. Um, somebody showed me a file of uh, letters to, fa you know, pink slips to the faculty back in 74 saying the Board of Trustees cannot guarantee, am I, am I making that happen? The Board of Trustees cannot guarantee that you will uh, get a paycheck next year, that you will be, we will be in business. Uh, in its wisdom, the state picked up the school as uh, an honors college within the state system, affiliated it with, maybe I'll give that to the provost to see if that works. And I beg your pardon, I, I neglected to introduce my colleagues. I'm, I'm, I'm most embarrassed by that. Uh, most of you know Charlene Callahan, our provost, who's a glutton for punishment in her second stint as provost. Keeps flipping backwards, I'm not quite sure why. We'll leave it in her good hands for a moment, see if it works. The virus. In her real life, Dr. Callahan is a social psychologist. The relevance of that to her duties as provost are considerable. Uh, and most of you know uh, John Martin, Vice President for Finance Administration, who in addition to being uh, close to his first decade at New College, served uh, in Finance Administration at FSU for nearly 20 years or so, which not only gives some good system-wide knowledge base useful to us all, but uh, since our neighbor, the Ringling Museum of Art, is of course an FSU facility now, uh, it's very useful because of his past experience and uh, the relations between uh, FSU and the Ringling Museum. Well, before I interrupted myself, I was just going to come back to the theme that in the midst of multiple administrative changes, going from private to public, being part of USF from 75 to what was it, Governor Beard, 2001, uh, New College being spun off as the 11th member of the State University System in 2001. That wasn't just a New College spin-off year, that was the year the Board of uh, Regents was abolished, that was the year the individual boards were first established. A lot was going on uh, and it was tough times, particularly tough for us and uh, USF Sarasota Manatee with whom we shared the campus because the enabling legislation that made us independent uh, simply split the operating budget 50-50 between us and said to New College, you need, you're obligated to seek independent accreditation right away and said to USF Sarasota, you're obligated to find a new campus in which to pursue the USF Sarasota Manatee program, basically on 50-50 split. Um, there was money appropriated for New College's startup. It was vetoed not once but twice. Uh, Governor Bush subsequently told me that had nothing whatsoever to do with New College and, and uh, gave me the background reasons for, for that concern. It had something to do with him and Senate President John McKay and I see the Chancellor grinning. Uh, 
but the disadvantage of starting up on the basis of vetoed startup money and simply splitting your operating budget 50-50 with your sister institution, USF Sarasota Manatee, kind of explains the subsequent <coughs> narrative of reasons we've been coming to this board and, uh, and, and getting such a positive response, gratifyingly enough, for our ongoing financial needs. Uh, I have no idea whether we're, we're going to be able to make this thing work, but if we can keep going through here. Uh, in a nutshell, our niche, from the standpoint most important to this audience, is we keep a lot of bright kids in state who would otherwise leave to go to a small liberal arts college. Florida is not strong in the tradition of small residential liberal arts colleges the way New England states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, the Midwestern states are strong in that area. Uh, and a lot of kids and a lot of families like the idea of small classes, tenure, tenure track faculty, teachers who know you by name, the opportunity to develop leadership skills in extracurricular life that the small campus environment offers. Granted, we have a lot of overlapping applications of our students with, with very fine uh, honors programs, honors colleges through the state, some of which we've learned about today. Um, but by and large, kids who apply to new college want to go to a small college, no big surprise. And we're the state option that keeps them here. And since most of them are on bright futures, that keeps them here at great financial advantage to their families. I, I'm just back. I'm not coming over from Sarasota. I'm just back from Asheville, North Carolina, the annual meeting at UNC Asheville of the uh, COPLAC, Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges. Interesting schools, College of Charleston, Mary Washington, UNC Asheville, um, St. Mary's of Maryland. And we all get together to celebrate not just our commitment to liberal arts, but the access we provide to students from whatever kinds of family means uh, to a high quality residential liberal arts experience that doesn't have the price tag of the very expensive uh, private places. Granted, a lot of those places are able to discount to a great degree, uh, but nonetheless, we often provide the most affordable opportunity for such students, which is why we continue to draw about 20% of our students from out of state, even with the tuition differential between in-state and out-of-state. And in our own way, we're sustaining the discussion about liberal arts and sciences. Uh, as I'll say in a minute, I think we're right in the middle of the discussion of the STEM fields and other critical needs fields. Uh, I sometimes get a little depressed in statewide meetings at the lack of discussion of educating the whole person, uh, giving people a good, strong grounding in liberal education. Someone once defined liberal arts colleges as, as the means of keeping open the nation's museums. Uh, a good liberal arts who think across disciplinary boundary lines, who, who aren't just stuck thinking in their own field uh, and can find um, <coughs> satisfaction in thinking across those boundary lines. Uh, I'll come back to that theme perhaps in a moment. Well, we'll see how this is working. All right, we're on three here. Okay. Well, what distinguishes us is not only small size, about 825 students. We've gone from 490 in 1992 to 650 in the late 90s to the current 800. I'll say before I conclude that I think 1200 is a nice target. Uh, but our mission emphasizes providing a high quality liberal arts education to honors quality students in a setting emphasizing active individualized learning. The really important part of that remark is the emphasis we put on active individualized learning and how we're very self-conscious about what that means. Uh, when we went independent in 2001 and I started strolling the halls of the Capitol and working on behalf of the college, I'd occasionally be taken aside by uh, one of our elected officials, typically with a degree from one of the other institutions in our state, who would rather grumpily say, why should a strictly undergraduate place liberal arts college, no less, have the same standing in the state as our great research institutions. And I learned to respond to that remark by saying, uh, just think, you can always tell your constituents who send their sons and daughters to new college that they'll never have a graduate teaching assistant as their teacher. Uh, they will always have simply only a full-time tenure, tenure track person who knows them by name and teaches them in a class setting where they can't hide in the back of the class because there is no back of the class. 
what we do is help people make connections. We have a traditional 18 to 22 year old population uh, and we help them make connections across ways of thinking, across disciplines. We help them make connections between in-class and out-of-class learning. And we help them make connections between the campus and the community. Uh, I submit, just as an editorial aside, that <coughs> our collective incapacity to make connections seems to account for a lot of our problem in cleaning up the mess in the Gulf. Uh, everything seems to be operating out of some kind of silo and the connections between business and science and social policy and environment and where people are living, very, very challenging for people to make those connections, but I submit that it's precisely those connections uh, we need to make to address issues such as that. The way to summarize this is to say we're ed trying to educate the whole student. That's, that's kind of an airy notion, educate the whole student. Um, and I'm never quite sure what it means. It has something to do with character formation, value formation. Um, you know, keep, keep in mind the, uh, the Nazi regime knew a lot about science, technology, and engineering, and math. They didn't know what to do with that expertise. Um, the contrast case is the element of character formation, value formation, that goes into trying to educate the whole student. I don't know how hard to press that point. I just know that if a small residential liberal arts college is not serious about wanting to educate the whole student, no place is. So we take that issue very seriously. Sometimes I get a little pushback from faculty when they hear me talk about character formation. And they say, you're trying to get me to be a role model. And I say, let me ask you this. When you teach your classes, when kids come into a course, do you emphasize intellectual honesty? And they say, well, of course. And I say, you're already in the business of character formation with that commitment. Here's the meat of what we do. Here's how we give meaning to active and individualized learning. I alluded earlier to the lack of credit hours. The registration device at new colleges is not piling up a certain number of credits. It's designing an act, a learning contract. It's an actual form. The cosmos hates that expression, evidently. It's an actual form. The student has to lay out a statement of educational goals for the semester. This ensures that the student will be self-conscious about what he or she is trying to achieve. And then a list of typically courses, maybe a tutorial or two, some independent research, some off-campus work. Uh, and then a statement of what level of proficiency would have to be achieved to consider that contract satisfied. If it's too loosey-goosey or there's some problem with the contract, the faculty advisor will not sign it. Both the student and the faculty member have to sign it. Once the student signs the contract, he or she becomes responsible for, for fulfilling it. So there we try to get across the message that the flip side of your freedom that you take into the design of your contract is personal accountability. That's the message from day one. That's the message across the four years. That's the message in student life as well as in academic life. You are invited to pursue your personal freedom here, but in a setting that emphasizes that along with that comes personal accountability, including accountability to the whole community. We require seven contracts, completed contracts for graduation. Instead of grades on the courses and tutorials that the student is taking, uh, they receive narrative evaluations. Very onerous and time consuming for the faculty, but we love the system. There's never a discussion about grades. You never have a kid coming after you return a batch of papers saying, what do I have to do to get an A on the next paper? Uh, it helps promote our notion that faculty and students are fellow learners on the same pathway, so that the faculty a little farther along that pathway. Uh, three independent study projects are required for graduation. Those are typically done in January. They might be done in the summer. Those are designed to teach students the skills, research skills necessary for the uh, last requirement, the uh, senior thesis. All of our students do a senior thesis. And at the end of the thesis experience, they have to schedule an oral exam, or we call it a baccalaureate. At least three faculty have to be present at the oral exam. 
It might be four if it's an interdisciplinary project. And the baccalaureates are open to the campus community. So typically a lot of the students' peers and maybe some other interested faculty be present. Can't tell you how often I hear from graduates from across the years what a valuable experience that was for graduate and professional school, job interviews, job settings, just that capstone experience. And by the way, the student is required to bring to the baccalaureate a copy of his or her transcript. There is a transcript with satisfactory, unsatisfactory for all the work the student's done. And at the end of the oral grilling on the thesis, anything on the transcript is fair game for the faculty present to ask about. And that can be pretty interesting. Traditionally, New College has been a feeder school for PhD programs. When I arrived in 92, the latest information showed that we were seventh in the nation on a per capita basis in producing graduates who went on to get PhDs. We've sort of been proud about this in an unreflective way, but when we went independent and I got more interested in alumni giving, uh, about the same time that the job market for PhDs was looking pretty grim, we took, an, we took a renewed interest in other career tracks as well, but in any case you see from this uh, sample that from across the curriculum, most of our students go on to graduate and professional school in some field. Fewer these days for PhD programs. Uh, we're producing more medical doctors, which has made, made it interesting for me to, to hear all the discussions at this board about uh, medical education. Um, and uh, a lot of interest in combined PhD MD programs uh, because of the ongoing interest in, in research. As you can figure, the uh, advanced students, the thesis students, especially for our scientists, are basically graduate assistants to them in their research. And a lot of students in those fields come away with co-publication uh, opportunities for the research they've done. Speaking of the sciences, we, we spent a lot of money in that area over the years. If you visit the campus, or next time you visit the campus, or many of you have been to the campus, you see a big, relatively new science complex, and you go down the road a little ways, and you see a great big marine biology lab, and you say, geez, how much science stuff does this place need? Uh, you need a lot uh, to stay ahead of the curve to show that you're going to continue inve to invest in that area that's of most interest to your smartest high school kids. Um, I could name names of private liberal arts colleges that have really lost their reputations within their peer group and with science kids because they stopped investing or failed to invest or backed off from that expensive service contract for the electron microscopes, uh, all the other things that go with it. Uh, I had, uh, after 17 years in the faculties at Davidson College at Oberlin College, two very fine schools with very strong math and science, I knew something about the planning ahead for investment in those areas. Uh, you might even say, and the Tim Joneses of the world might, might say that we're a little overbuilt in, in lab capacity, um, but you get an interesting discussion going among our lab scientists if you use that language on our campus. We do have one Florida congressman as an alum, Lincoln diaz Ballard. Um, his brother Jose, who's of course a prominent broadcaster in the Miami area, um, is another New College alum. Mario is, I forget, Chancellor, where Mario might have gone to college, uh, but he must have had other SAT scores than his brothers. So. Uh, there have been some talk about ratings. I'm interested in Governor Colson's interest in the ratings because I, I have very torn feelings about them. I know it's one way to kind of benchmark where you are. I would just say, as I tell families, well, we do very well in them, as you all know, because we're shameless about sending out notices when we do well. When we don't do well, I give the speech about how all of us in higher education are aware that the methodology connected with this rating is seriously flawed. Uh, <laughs> but you've got to watch what they're measuring. And I tell families of prospective students, you'd be crazy to pick a college according to where it is in a rating. L look at what they're measuring and see if it's important to you. To me, what's most significant about New College showing up in these ratings a lot, it, it brings a lot of favorable attention to our state for reasons other than football. And uh, it shows the world, beginning with our fellow citizens in our state, 
that public education doesn't just mean big university. It can mean small, intimate scale place and begin to get the word out through the venues of such uh, high profile publications as these that there's another way. We've got a lot of issues to face. Uh, I suspect none is more important than our interest in improving our own retention rate. We've pushed our six-year graduation rate up from the high 40s to the low to mid 60s since the mid 90s. But even there, uh, we are way out of whack with our aspirational peers in the private sector with whom we compare favorably in many other respects such as student faculty ratio. Uh, our graduation rate ought to be well into the 80s. Uh, I think there are a number I could, I could spend a lot of time, which I promise I won't do, analyzing the reasons for it. I think a lot of it has to do with small size. A lot of it has to do with the kind of a sink or swim mentality that has traditionally been in place at New College. Even among senior veteran faculty, you ought to know better. I confronted this in my early years at New College when the chair of the Natural Sciences Division, otherwise a very thoughtful, helpful colleague, when I worried about the graduation rate in his presence, he, he, he sloughed it off and said, oh, no, no, this is sink or swim. If you're, if you're meant to get your degree here, you'll get your degree, but it's not for everybody. Not only did that seem a misshapen view on the face of it, it it's, it's a very expensive view that he was expecting the rest of us to pay for. It cost a lot of money to replace the student who's gone, so it was just bad business sense. Uh, <clears throat> we've been working hard on strengthening advising. We've been working hard on improving the connections between student affairs and academic affairs. That's a very important connecting point for us with respect to spotting students at risk, helping students at risk. Uh, students who change their interests whom we just can't accommodate, the math student who discovers they want to pursue engineering, we just can't help or keep. Uh, <clears throat> and then the interesting phenomenon of students who break up with boyfriends or girlfriends and then they're living in a community where all they see is their ex-girlfriends or boyfriends. I, if, if you have any collective <laughs> advice from the wisdom of this board to offer me on that issue, I would dearly love it because I've been struggling with that one for quite some time. Skip to the bottom of that list. Uh, we've had an odd history in fundraising because our foundation began as the reconstituted Board of Trustees of the private New College. When the state picked up New College in 1975, it said, we will keep you in business, but we're sure not going to fund you at the 10 to 1, 11 to 1 student-faculty ratio you're operating at. Your board will have to reconstitute itself as a fundraising board and pay the difference. Great idea in principle, and one of our cardinal strengths is the public-private partnership that underwrites the college. But the state did not make that foundation a DSO, a direct support organization. So it was a 501c3 organization, which built up its endowment to about $40 million, was run for 23, 24 years by a former member of this board, General Roland Heiser. Some of you recall fondly from his board days. Uh, but bless his heart, General Heiser, and he'd be the first to admit it, um, thought of himself as the keeper of the flame on behalf of New College to protect it against whatever terrible acts the University of South Florida from the north might undertake. Well, there were never any terrible acts. Uh, uh, our, our relationship with USF was always just fine, um, but as an administrator, the chief administrator at New College from 92 to 97, I was perennially caught between the people to whom I reported, the provost at USF, and the three presidents going through the revolving doors doing my five years as in, in my job. Uh, and the foundation and its interests where a lot of private money, a lot of local clout resided. When we went independent, the school was, the foundation was still not a DSO. So as the new president, I faced certain challenges in, in uh, working on the fundraising goals and, and issues. Uh, I see Governor Beard smiling because he, <laughs> he knows many of the players. Uh, but. Uh, President Rosenberg, when he was chancellor, helped, helped us construct a solution to this, which led to a seemly evolution of the new college foundation to DSO status, ensuring that the president of the college, whether it be me or people coming after me, had appropriate authority over fundraising 
uh, I'm, you can all understand how critical that was and that is. And I, I just gave you the very sanitized version of that interesting story. I, that will be my third <laughs> book I write. Well, you've seen the information from our work plan. I won't belabor it. I'm more interested in the broad themes. <clears throat> I will point out that, and you've seen these beautiful pictures where you know from visiting the campus, we're smack dab on the bayfront. Now, for us, sustainability, strong sense of environmental concern, ecological literacy as a mark of the liberally educated person, these are very immediate issues. Very interesting for us when we became independent in 2001 and assumed authority over campus master planning. People at New College had never had a role in campus master planning. It was always done by USF. Suddenly it's in our lap and we have a campus master plan to construct. And I called a meeting of the entire campus early in the process and said, we're not thinking five years down the road, 10 years down the road, even 20 years down the road. We're thinking at least 50 years down the road. And I said, here's the thought experiment. Imagine the people at New College 50 years down the road looking back on us and the decisions we make now. Try to imagine the very worst things they might say about the decisions we're making now. And I said, just speaking for me personally, the very worst thing they could say is, why or oh, why did they screw up the Bayfront? And the second worst thing is, why or oh, why did they pave over this entire beautiful campus with parking lots? And just sort of invited people to go from there, and I, th I think we've come out with a very good working document. Uh, <clears throat> but when the President's commitment to sustainability practices and, and cutting carbon emissions and all those things came along, uh, all those things fit in perfectly with our own campus ethos and with the fact that we've had an environmental studies program since 1972 uh, with many of our most exemplary graduates being veterans of that. And you'll be interested to know with respect to internationalizing the curriculum, which has been a priority for some time, which is, which is code for um, keeping, the keeping the small college from succumbing to the dangers of insularity and provincialism. That's the kiss of death for a small place. You can, we got all this great rhetoric about small classes and teachers knowing you by name. Uh, the flip side is insularity, provincialism. That's another reason to support faculty research. You support faculty research and emphasize that they stay connected with the wider world. And that's a good thing. They don't take every on-campus decision as a referendum on their entire careers, which I discovered faculty who don't do research tend to do late in their careers. Uh, but in recent years, we started a Chinese language and culture program with two full-time positions. Uh, we've added in development, developmental economics with a Latin American specialist. We've added an African culture position. Uh, small steps for a small school, but they make a big difference in our setting and are indicative of uh, <coughs> our, our attempt not only to bring the world to us, but get our people out into the world. Uh, you've probably noticed our success in Fulbright grants. We got seven Fulbrights this year. We had eight last year. We've had. I think 44 since we went independent in 2001. That's very satisfying because it shows that our best students really aspire to get out into the world and they're picking up that message from what goes on on campus. Madam Chair, I think I'll stop there. I'm probably skipping over. Uh, there's one more thing I should probably allude to. Um, oh, yes. Promised you some remarks about 1,200. A lot of good research out there on striking the right balance between breadth and depth in the liberal arts curriculum. It's, it's, it's tricky kind of designing the curriculum because we don't quite know where the liberal arts are going to go. I know that New College wants to be at the forefront of that discussion. That's, that's one of the most interesting things facing us. How to adapt a liberal arts and science education to the issues of the 21st century. Very interesting. Uh, but I, I know my view is that uh, with a student-faculty ratio of somewhere between 11 to 1, 10 to 1, an enrollment of 1,200 would make us a better place. Uh, I get big pushback on that from alums, especially, which just proves the dictum that there's no place quite so conservative as a small experimental college. <laughs> so on that note, Madam Chair, I just want to, if, if you do one thing for me, if you would go to slide 11 at least, Kind of go through your, your tuition differential? Piece. Absolutely. Be happy to. Yeah, uh, do that. Please. Well, in addition to the required, you can see, by the way, 
our scale. We're not dealing with a lot of money here. Uh, our QEP, our uh, quality enhancement plan to satisfy SAC's requirements, uh, about to embark on its second year, is a series of uh, specially designed seminars only for first and second year students in which we're emphasizing and also tracking the development of writing skills for research purposes to see if, if as we follow that, those cohorts, cohorts through their careers, if that results in an improved rate of success in completing the thesis. We have a lot of students who don't graduate simply because they don't complete the senior thesis. That suggests we're not attending well enough to the research skills along the way. We, we've contributed a lot of students to the other schools in the system, particularly USF, because they'll do everything at New College and then tack on an extra semester, complete their degree at one of the other institutions. Um, and our Academic Resource Center is an effort to, it, it is our most um, consolidated effort to enhance our technological capacity for, for academic uh, purposes. We have, for the first time ever, a new classroom building going up. Most of our camp, most of our classrooms, classes meet in buildings retrofitted, you know, Ringling Estate and other buildings retrofitted for that purpose, old former dorms. We're finally putting up a purpose-built classroom building, so we're very self-conscious about the technological issues that ought to inform state-of-the-art uh, teaching settings. And um, the Academic Resource Center, that's actually located in the library, but it's emblematic of our effort to finally get ahead of that technology curve. We've We've, we've struggled with the interface between administrative and academic computing because the models that work best in that area for the big places don't work so well for small places. And uh, we're going through a new iteration of how to organize ourselves in terms of administrative and academic computing. Thank you very much. Sure. Any questions? Governor Edwards. I uh, well could be the only board member who has visited the new college when they were private, when they were part of USF, and, and as part of our uh, are their independence. Uh, I'm well aware of General Heiser, who I believe called me every day for about four years when I was chairman of the Board of Regents to help get the old mansions restored, and that's certainly he was right. I, I want to go to a small part of your plan when it said, uh, you know, improve your relationship with the arts. I think Sarasota is the only city in the state who has the University of Florida there with IFAS, Florida State there with uh, Wrangling and with the, the uh, Performing Arts Center, uh, USF there with their regional campus and with New College. I, I don't want to speak for President Barron, nor am I even going to attempt, but I, I will say I have had discussions with prior administrations at Florida State, particularly as it related to Ringling. Uh, I assume this is still a fact. I toured Ringling one time and was amazed to discover that the second largest collections of Rubens in the world was located at Ringling, most of which were in the basement. Uh, this is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous collection. I had the idea, which I thought was excellent, of arranging to tour these paintings around our state university system. And everybody thought it was a great idea until one thing came up, insurance. Uh, bottom line is we simply did not have the funding to insure those. Uh, where, I'm, where I'm leading to and again, this, in my personal opinion, this is not something that our board should do, but only if FSU and New College can work it out. But it has always made sense to me, from what I understand, and again, Eric, I'm not speaking for you nor, nor attempting to, uh, the FSU is happy with the Performing Arts Center. Uh, I'm not sure they're happy with, with rank. To me, it would be a better match for Wrangling to go to New College with what you're trying to do, with all the things that are there, and, I, and it would certainly keep you as a small liberal arts college with the same number of students, but 
as far as your overall reputation and the, the reputation of the system, I think could be enhanced by better utilization of Ringling and the mansions on the river, which are fabulous facilities. Does this fit into your long-range plan, and would you have interest is what I think I'm well, I'm, long Governor Edwards, I'm somewhere approach. between I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, and uh, <clears throat> there's plenty of food for thought there. This is not... <laughs> this... This is not the first time this issue has been raised, given the instability and in, uh, university oversight of, uh, of uh, the Ringling Museum. Uh, I guess our general attitude is that we, we live in a very educationally, culturally rich neighborhood. USF Sarasota Manatee is to the north of us, and by the way, it's much easier being a neighbor than roommates. Uh, you have New College, and then you have FSU with the Ringling and Oslo complex. And by the way, New College's own fine arts complex is to the south of the FSU property. Uh, we're sort of split up uh, north and south as well as east and west by the trail. Uh, so I would think the way to come at that is, is to, to wonder out loud in, in a system-wide way what's the best way to maximize the, the collective potential of uh, this extraordinary collection of educational and artistic and cultural neighbors. Uh, in keeping with the strong Sarasota interest in tradition, one reason we have this arts initiative uh, underway is we've had enormous success 10 years into it now in uh, reaching out to the community for experimental music purposes and filling a 200-seat auditorium every, every time we give this music that might put some people on edge. And we want to replicate that across the arts because of the town gown opportunities and the enrichment for our students. Uh, <clears throat> And, you know, we've always had great relations with the uh, Ringling Museum, and uh, John Martin here was at the table when some of the more contentious issues occurred back there in the 90s uh, in connection with agreements that, uh, you know, brought, you may remember when Senator Lisa Carlton had to get around the table and knock a few heads together. Um, it was interesting for me personally, going from President D'Alembert to President Wetherell uh, with respect to these issues. Uh, I think President D'Alembert had, had a... Had a much deeper interest in uh, developing the museum. I think that's no secret. And uh, it's too early for uh, President Barron and me to have much of a conversation about any of these things. But we're happy to be partner and certainly cash in on the collective value of uh, all the enterprises represented right there on the Bayfront. I'd like to speak to that point for a moment. Governor Frost. Please. First of all, I want to congratulate you on what you're doing. It was a great presentation. I think I'm really at Oxford with the tutorial system or back in the Northeast in a small liberal arts college. There are some of us who did go to schools like that or run little schools like that for the last 25 years in Miami. But I want to speak to the, the museum because I think it's an asset to our entire system. <clears throat> As you know, we did an international search to get the right architect to do the Frost Art Museum at FIU, and Jan Weymouth was the architect who was the lead architect with I.M. Pei to do the Pyramid at the Louvre. Uh, he did the East Wing with us at the Smithsonian. And he did the ex little addition to the ring, the renovation or whatever. We now have in Miami the former director of the ring working at one of our other local museums. And we are about to, at the Frost Art Museum, opening, open an exhibition of 17th century art in the fall with donated Rubens. Some of them might come from that particular museum. So I would like to not now, but possibly down the road, if this is at all possible, to be able to share some of these assets. I know insurance is high, but we somehow found donors for this exhibition because things will travel from all over the world there. Uh, who will be willing to foot the bill. And the best thing that for us would be if we could put together a traveling exhibition. And so don't give it away yet. 
I'm not uh, suggesting we give it away it. at all. I'm yeah, suggesting we you, utilize maybe it. Maybe they all want it. Yeah. But I think it's something where you talk about collaboration in the arts, in science, in technology. I think in the area of art and music, certainly there is a lot that we can all cooperate with. And especially the treasures that are in that basement, because they are treasures. Now, Dr. Barron is, is asking for an opportunity to comment. I think that mic may be live over there at the podium, Dr. Barron. This is unprecedented during the course of this retreat. <laughs> <laughs> there is one issue, and that is the current president of Florida State University, although a scientist, was wandering around the Met and the National Galleries as a kid about this big and I am an extraordinary fan of the arts and even though I've only been in office for four months I have already had three trips to Sarasota to do fundraising to ensure that that museum takes its place as one of the finest places in the world for not just the Rubens and so we are reinvesting in that museum in terms of uh, development officers and uh, already put uh, a lot of resources there. I would be very eager to learn the best ways to uh, to share those treasures, but I will commit myself to wrestling with anybody else who wishes to well, have it be anywhere else. I will, uh, I, I will apologize. Uh, <laughs> we'll, let you have, we'll let you have the expense and we'll just take no, the no. treasures. I am very pleased to hear that. That has not been the recent history, and I'm not knocking it, but that's not been the recent history of FSU. You've answered my question. Now what we need to do uh, as a system is not take it away from FSU anymore. That's, that was just a thought. But we need to utilize it. That's where probably where I'm coming from. Madam Chair, I should add that we, yes. have, we have actually received environmental awards, sustainability awards for cooperative energy saving projects between New College and FSU with respect to the Ringling property. We share chilled water capacity, so if somebody goes offline, they, they can pick up off, off the neighbor. And uh, this, to me, kind of exemplifies the best way to kind of move forward. Governor Tripp? I, I have a comment, then a question. Before our cherished president got up and made that commitment, which is wonderful, what I was going to suggest to you is suggest a great partnership. You'll run, you'll run it for him and let him pay for it. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't even charge him a fee for running it as long as he continues to pay for it. But now he's, he's made it even better for you. So. Thank you, Governor Tripp. The thing that I just have this question, and maybe others have, you know, have thought about it. Tell me how, because your students aren't graded, when they graduate and they're now going out for postgraduate degrees, et cetera, what is it that they show the other universities, et cetera, uh, that gets them into these programs? I know they get into them. I'm just curious of how that works and uh, does it pose any problems or has that been resolved? It occasionally poses problems. What they send or what they have sent from the registrar's office is, as I said, a transcript. They have a copy of all the activities they've completed with a S or a U or an I, satisfactory, unsatisfactory, incomplete. But I think the meatiest part of what they sell is they, they will typically choose a selection of their narrative evaluations to include in their applications to jobs, for jobs as well as for graduate school. And from the get-go, graduate and professional schools have been impressed with the level and degree of feedback students have been getting. Uh, even for very good students, detailed feedback tends to come across as pretty harsh uh, because you spend more time talking about areas needing improvement than things people did well. Uh, but uh, students are creative in the cluster of narrative evaluations they'll send. When they have a problem, and typically the biggest problem comes up in certain kinds of med schools our graduates have not gone on to before that require a combined MCAT number, MCAT score, and GPA just to get through the front door of the admissions office and their application will get bumped because they can't provide that and then we have mechanisms that, that start with the provost office for reaching out to those schools and interpreting our, our uh, way of doing life. The, the best thing that happened to us is that first generation of new college students who were basically bought um, 
you know, the ones who arrived in 64 when we first enrolled students, uh, the school bought uh, not just the students, but they paid a lot of money for PSAT and SAT scores, and then deluged the highest testing students across the nation with this literature about this great new place where Arnold Toynbee was going to teach history, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. And it was a pre-selected, really smart group, the charter class, or three first charter classes. And they went off, you know, you, some of you know John Craner, he used to be head of our foundation, he went off to Harvard Business School. They get into all the right places. A, a member of our board who was in the second class went off to get a PhD at Yale and uh, broke the ice and we got some good publicity at the same time from the national media and, and in academic quarters that's held us in good stead ever since. You, Madam you, Chair, just a quick comment to end, I, I suppose. Um, I spoke earlier of discipline and um, on that score I use New College as an example on a regular basis. Uh, they know who they are, they know what they are, they're very comfortable with both of those things and they aspire every year to be nationally recognized in that niche. And um, while they don't do research, while they don't have a football team, while they don't uh, uh, do a lot of things that some of our bigger, um, more generally prestigious universities do on that scale, uh, New College is a great example of a very disciplined organization that short of wanting to grow their enrollment over a period of time, which is reasonable, uh, are nationally recognized every year as one of the best at what they do. And I think if we all took that approach to decide who we are, what we are, and what we aspire to be, and build a business plan to get there, and not deviate to a great degree from that business plan, we would have more and more and more nationally recognized universities coming from the state of Florida, generally speaking. And uh, that is not to dim diminish what any universities do, but it is an object lesson of what, what great laser-focused discipline can mean when a mission is created by a university and that mission is stuck to over time. Congratulations for Thank, Appreciate that, Chance. So I, will, I will just add that um, one reason we keep that focus is we have nothing else to fall back on. <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I remind people in tough budget times, we have to stay mission-centered and academically strong and student-centered because we have nothing else to fall back on. By the way, we do all that for seven-tenths of one percent of the entire budget for the state university system. So it, it, per student, it comes out a little high, as my fellow presidents remind me a lot. but. Uh, statewide, I think it's a good, good return on investment. Governor Savannah. Uh, yes, I was looking at your enrollment plan, and for 2009-10, uh, you had or 656 funded, and it and it looks so like a plan to to stay at about um, six, just under 700. Uh, those are FTE. You want to speak to those? FTE. But uh, let me just. It, and however, on the uh, stats on the first page, you've got 787. So I, I know that admissions is is not a, a science; it's more of an art form. So is this more? You always kind of over accept. Did more people show up at your door than you anticipated would show up? Because you seem to be. Those first numbers are. We have no summer school. We have no summer session. And those first numbers are FTEs, which, which, disc, which leaves you a lower number than we actually have bodies present. Uh, oh, okay. I've got you. All right, I see that. And mm -hmm. um, so the... But, so, you, but the plan is to stay level. You, you don't plan to... When we've, grown, when we've grown before, in those two iterations, from 490 to 650, then mm -hmm. from 650 to 800, we had three principles in play. No degradation in the quality of the student body, mm -hmm. which means it's easiest to grow if you improve re retention. So that was part of the method in our madness. Um, no erosion of the student-faculty ratio, which meant we had to add faculty as we went along. And then the board still, and earlier on before the board days, were committed to housing 75 to 80 percent of our students on campus. So every time we grow, we have to build new dorms. Seven of the newest buildings on campus are residence halls. Um, so, and we about damn near killed ourselves putting up these last five dorms, uh, especially John Martin here. Uh, 
And if we expedited the moving from 800 to 1200, we'd either have to dilute that percentage living on campus or we'd right away have to go out and figure out how to get a bond issue or something else or a wealthy donor to get a new dorm because the state doesn't pay for dorms. And even if the state did pay for dorms, we'd probably still be right. stuck. Right. So it's, right now we're looking to be the best darn 800 student, student school we can be while we reflect on the times and our mission and what the liberal arts spells for the 21st century. And then, I, and I'm sort of thinking in terms of faculty workload with that number of students and the number of, of faculty you have, um, I can appreciate the uh, demand on the faculty doing those written narratives. And then there's the thesis uh, at, at any a particular year about how many thesis students does a faculty is a faculty member responsible for? Uh, I think it averages probably four or five per four. faculty member. There's a quite a range. Uh, what we should think about too, and uh, Chancellor Brogan pointed out that we don't do research, and I would be remiss as provost to, if I let that pass. Uh, New college faculty are very productive researchers, and we have pretty stringent right. tenure criteria. I just meant in the, in the yes, I know we're not research. Re we're not a research institution. Category. Exactly, but you've got to be doing scholarship, or the faculty are doing a form of scholarship, or they wouldn't be able to do the kinds of things they're doing with your students. So, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a given. The fact that I, we are very student intensive. Mm -hmm. If you think about the faculty advisors with that contract. Those are those are one on one meetings that occur several times a semester to advise the students uh, the tutorials that take place in addition to classes. So um, I'll put it on record that our faculty work hard. Yeah. Hopefully they'll appreciate that. Yeah. I will say, Governor Solano, that you will understand this, that the official course load is 2-2, which is light for a liberal arts college. But we know that the cumulative effect of taking on additional tutorials okay. and thesis sponsorship uh, makes that closer to 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. yeah, I can appreciate that. I mean, it helps to know the 2-2, two, two, but still, I, I think that's quite a, quite a load with those narrative um, uh, performance evaluations, if you will, and, and then the thesis students. I did spend four years as a full-time faculty member between my two administrative stints, and so I appreciate your point from a visceral first hand mm -hmm. standpoint. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, you all.